I will uh, briefly introduce everyone and then uh, invite each speaker to make um, a roughly half an hour presentation. Then we leave, um, you know, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, then at the end, if, uh, you know, if it is possible, then we probably will uh, allow another 10 or 15 minutes for the audience to raise questions. I mean, okay, good afternoon. Um, uh, Professor Tao actually asked me to chair this um, online seminar. The purpose is, of course, is to foster cross-field collaborations. Um, um, today we have uh, three speakers. They are all working in the area of construction management. Um, they uh, used different sensors to study construction workers in terms of, you know, uh, measuring their physiological uh, loadings and also to understand the work intensities. Uh, I noticed some of you probably not familiar with uh, the construction industry. Um, our industry um, is uh, very important because, because, because of its size, because in Hong Kong, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, 500,000 workers only uh, alone. But if you add all the um, uh, construction managers and the engineers together, I guess the total population can be probably, um, you know, can be at the the uh, the the range of 1 million, because consider Hong Kong only has three to uh, six to seven million people. Um, so probably 1 million people are working in uh, construction related jobs. So this is why it's important. However, in our industry, the, the, um, the level of technology we adopt seem to be relatively low. Um, comparing to other industries such as manufacturing industry. So for this reason, I think that there's a, a, a great demand for, uh, for the industry, from the industry, you know, for new technologies. And for this, for this purpose, I think um, uh, there's a big opportunity for us to work together, you know, between people working in the construction management and those people who are producing uh, wearable sensors. So for this reason, we invited three uh, researchers in our field. Uh, they are all very active researchers. Some of them actually are very well known, a rising star, and uh, some actually uh, already achieved international reputations. So let's um, start by into, uh, inviting Dr. Juno Sil. Uh, Juno is a, a colleague of mine. Um, he obtained his uh, PhD from Michigan University. You know, before that, he actually was um, studying the, uh, you know, the bachelor and master degree in uh, a famous university in Seoul. I said earlier, Jun, uh, Juno is one of the pioneers in adopting uh, IT and a different kind of sensors to understand the relationship between workers and their job. Um, with no further ado, can we now just welcome uh, Dr. Juno Sell to deliver his presentation. Juno, are you ready? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Thank you for your introduction. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, really? we can. Okay. okay, okay, let me share my screen. Also, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for, first of all, thank you for inviting me to, to this the variable seminar. So I am the AG Professor Lee introduced. I am uh, Dr. Juno Sao, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of the Building and Real Estate. 
And I've been working on the, the wear of sensors for years, and I did many different research, but I strongly believe that using the wear of sensing technology is one of the game changer to improve the, the construction performance. Uh, today, I will give you some talks regarding the smart construction with the sensing technologies based on my previous research work. Okay, let me start first. Uh, let me start with the, the research background first. And maybe some of you may not be from the construction area, but the construction industry is quite unique because the pro construction project is the project based uh, and all the construction work in general it should be performed at the construction site. So due to that, this unique nature, though we are suffering from some low level of the mechanization and some the low level of the standardization. So that uh, we need to heavily rely on the human workforce, uh, the manual workforce uh, to perform the construction tasks. So in general, we can say the almost uh, 40 to 50% of the construction work should be done by the manual workers. And in some, uh, some tasks, almost uh, the 75% should be done by the manual workers. Uh, this the, the, the heavy reliance on the human, human the construction workforce uh, could lead to some many worker-related issues. First of all, the productivity of the construction industry is quite low compared to with the other industry. And also, the, the, we are having many some accidents and the safety issues. So in our domain, many researchers have tried to solve the, this problem, but the, there are some, some many approaches, but I see that this problem in this way, based on the, the demand capability model. The all construction workers are also human, right? During while they are working some tasks, uh, they are exposed to certain demand. But human has some limited capability so that during performing the tasks, the workers could be frequently exposed to the excessive the work, uh, work demand. And this is there, so that there should be some gap between that. And I see that the, all the work related issues is due to the gap between the work demand and the human capability. And the, in other domain like ergonomics, they already investigated the, some uh, uh, the work uh, human capability. So that the remaining thing is that we need to uh, understand how much uh, work demand workers are exposed to, and especially what kind of a work attribute could lead to the, this demand. We need to collect some data regarding this aspect to better understand the fundamental cause of the human work-related issues. But the problem is the field data collection is uh, not easy. Let, let's think about it. Probably when you are working on the street, you can see many construction sites and the construction environment is quite harsh and it is not easy to collect some field data. In general, to understand work demand and the, some work attribute information, we need to collect some these types of information. For example, location, where they are working, uh, and tasks, what, what kind of task they are performing, and also under which uh, the, the working environment. And also finally, we need to collect some data regarding the, the how much demand they are exposed to. So in general, previously, we have heavily relied on the just human observation or the survey-based approaches to collect this data. But you can simply guess it is quite time-consuming and quite subjective. In some, res uh, for, uh, some researchers have tried to simulate the construction task in the laboratory environment to collect the data. But the problem is the laboratory simulation cannot reflect all possible some variation existing at the construction site. Uh, due to these regions, uh, we have tried to use some automated approaches using some sensors uh, to collect some data regarding the workers. So the types of sensors can be classified into some image sensors and the wearable sensors. The image sensor is to extract some useful information by analyzing the data, uh, the, by analyzing the image data, and the wearable sensors is to collect some data directly from the workers by attaching the sensors to the workers. Actually, uh, at the beginning, actually, during my PhD, I will use the computer vision approaches. Okay, in the left side here, okay, here you can, you can see some videos. Uh, this is the video the analysis to extract some information regarding the workers uh, by using some deep, deep learning approaches. 
So using this computer vision based approaches, we can extract location data and also task data, what they are doing. Also, we can get some information regarding the work environment. But even though the, this, the, the, the usefulness of the, this vision-based approaches, it has been criticized due to some several limitations. The first of all, the first vision limitation is the limited coverage of the cameras. So the construction site is quite large, so that we cannot attach like 100 of cameras at the site. So that only we can uh, collect some video data at a specific location, not covering the whole site. And also the video is sometimes occluded by some other some objects or some other equipment. And another the most critical the limitation of the vision-based approach is that, okay, here, as you can see here, we can monitor the workers, but it is not easy to differentiate the different workers because even though we can identify, okay, there are some four workers working, but it's not easy who is who. It is some limitation of the, the, the vision-based approaches, especially in terms of the individual monitoring. So to address these issues, I've tried to use the wearable sensors. So for example, the wearable sensors, we can attach it to the, the workers so that we can directly collect the data from the individual workers. So using various, various types of the wearable sensors, for example, IMU, accelerometer, smart shoes, EMG, et cetera, we can collect some data from the individual workers regarding the behavior response or physiological response and the cognitive response. So that by analyzing the, this data, we can better understand work demand. So from now, let me briefly introduce some of my research work uh, that apply the wearable sensors. The first one is smart wearables for the behavioral analysis. Okay, for the behavioral analysis, we need to collect the data regarding the workers' motion, movement, and activity and the location uh, to identify some potential productivity, health, and the safety issues. And various, various types of sensors can be used, but I've focused on the use of the beacon and uh, put, uh, the, the acceleration sensors and also put pressure sensors. The first of all, to obtain the location data, but there are so many different types of the tracking technologies. But personally, I'm interested in using the, the beacon, BLE beacons. Uh, because uh, a BLE beacon is uh, quite uh, cheap and also easy to deploy at the construction site. So that even though the construction sites are changing, we can change the, the deployment of the beacon to collect the location data. And I've tested uh, this BLE beacon at the construction site uh, to see if, uh, how, it, uh, how it is reliable. And I found that it can provide very accurate the proximity, the estimation within the four or five meters. So that I found that to use the BLE beacon, we need to deploy the, the beacons at, at, uh, at every four or five meters to obtain the accurate location data. Now we know the where they are working. Uh, now, we, uh, the, uh, so as, as a next step, we need to know what they are performing, what they are doing. Uh, for this one, I will use the acceleration-based action recognition. Okay, in this slide, you can see some different types of the, the tasks for the masonry work and also corresponding the acceleration signals obtained from the wristband. So as you can see here, each task shows a different patterns of the acceleration signals so that by analyzing the signals, we can differentiate them. So especially to identify the, the different types of tasks by using the acceleration signals, I use the machine learning approaches. So probably you know the machine learning based action recognition. So that by segmenting the acceleration signals with the uh, labels, we can, uh, the, the, the deep learning classifier can run the pattern so that it can classify some activities. So to, but the, to extract some useful information from the this external recognition, how to define the activities is quite too important. So that I define the activities like this way. So first of all, activities can be classified into non-effective and the effective work. And the effective work can be further classified into a work with moving, which is traveling, and the work without moving, which is the working at a spot. 
Actually, on the left side, this the non effective work is totally non value added work. And the traveling, okay, it is some of uh, uh, the essential work, but it is not, it is not value added work because it is to support some tasks. On the right side, working without moving, working at a spot, this is the exactly value added work because I'm installing, assembling something. So that by classifying the activities and the labeling the activities in the, using the these categories, uh, we can better understand productivity issues. So I've tested these approaches uh, by through some field tests. So as you can see here, by collaborating with Able Engineering, which is the, one of the top contractors in Hong Kong, I've collected the acceleration data using Apple Watch, and also I attached uh, this GoPro video on the chest uh, to uh, to know the, what they are doing. So after collecting the data, I tested this the machine learning based action recognition, and I found that actually it provides very good accurate result, especially in terms of the classifying the effective and non effective work. The accuracy is over almost 95%. And to classify the three categories, uh, here we can, you can see some 80 or around 80% of the accuracy. So if then what we can do using the, this data, for example, this is one thing we can do. For example, here you can see two different workers with a different the, some, the, uh, the duration of the tasks. And then, and also we can obtain the, the location data using the beacon, uh, beacon, BLE beacon. So by comparing the, this data, maybe we can know uh, which area has some problem in terms of the productivity. And also we can identify which workers has relatively low productivity. Okay, this, this analysis, this result, it is not to remove the some non-effective workers. Instead, if they, some workers are, has relatively low productivity, there should be some reason. For example, uh, material was not properly delivered to the workers so that they need to wait for a long time. Likewise, uh, if we have uh, this data, we can identify potential some productivity issues so that we can take an action in, in a timely manner. And the second, uh, the, uh, another research is that the full risk detection using the, the, the IMU and the, the install sensors. Okay, install sensors is the, here, this is install, and this sensor has a pressure sensors so that during working, we can collect uh, in, uh, the, the put pressure data. And by analyzing this one, we can identify some full risks. So, for example, here, so some full risks. Uh, there are some four initiating events that could lead to the fall or the loss also balance. For example, slip, trip, uh, twist the ankle, or the unexpected step, uh, the step down. And this kind of four initiating event could be uh, decoded by some em uh, the environmental some risk factors. For example, slippery floor, some obstacles, and poor housekeeping, and uneven floor. So if we can detect this full initiating event, we can identify potential the risk factors exist, uh, existing at the construction site. So if then, how, we can, how can we identify this full initiating event? So I simulated these four different types of the full, the full initiating event at the laboratory environment. And we're using the machine learning approaches, I, I did, uh, tried to classify that. So based on the, this uh, experimental study, we found that the insole sensor data can predict almost 90% of the different types of full initiating event. So if then, how can we use it? Maybe construction workers are wearing this insole sensor and uh, automatically we can identify this event. And also we know the location data if we are using the beacon sensor. So if then, we can understand where these kind of risk factors would exist at the construction site, and then managers can go to that area to fix the problem. Okay, the second some uh, the area is the smart wearables for the physiological analysis. So here I I, I mainly there are so many different types of the physiological sensors that can measure some physical demand, but I mainly focus on the heart rate because the heart rate data can provide us some information regarding the physical demand. 
especially by using the percentage HRR. So I've collected the data from the construction workers for several months, and I compared the data, and I found very interesting things. Okay, this is one example of the, the data I collected. So you may know that the residential building in Hong Kong, it is a six-day cycle. The six-day cycle means that for the one story of the building, uh, they need to work for at least six days, which means that if there are some 50 floors, they're going to do the same work repeatedly every six days. So here you can see the three, some graph, the, this number one and the number two are same workers. So as I mentioned, this is a six day cycle so that they are doing exactly same work repeatedly for the every story. But the HR data, HR data, percentage HR data is an indicator of the physical demand. So in general, the, the first day, the demand is relatively low because there are many some preparation work, but demand would increase of the as the, the, the progress uh, go by. But in the here, this is the same worker, but this is in, in week one and week two. But you can see totally different work demand. If then let's think about why. So even though they are doing the same work, but in this week, here, especially uh, from the third to the sixth day, their demand is relatively low, which means that there were some issues. So the progress was, the construction progress was quite delayed. We can guess the progress is quite delayed in these days. So by analyzing the, this kind of data, we can also identify some potential, some productivity issues. And also the percentage HR data also indicate a sub indicator of the excessive physical demand. In general, if it is higher than the 40% or more than 30 minutes, it has been known that it's quite risky tasks. And also by continuously monitoring this percentage HRR, by collecting the, the heart rate data from the wristband, we can identify some risky moment so that we can give some alarm to the, the workers. And this data can provide some, uh, some personalized feedback on the productivity and the physical demand so that workers can, uh, would be able to self-regulate their, their tasks, minimizing their some health and safety risks. Okay, the last part is the smart wearables for the cognitive analysis. The construction accidents are highly associated with some cognitive failure. So, uh, let's put it this way. So at the, if you go to the construction site, there are many some ongoing work, but and at the same time, simultaneously, there could be some multiple, some, uh, some, some dangerous thing, hazard zone. For example, on the right side, there could be some openings without fence so that uh, it could lead to some fall. So that it is quite important to recognize those kind of hazards in a, the, 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 in a timely manner. But, but many workers sometimes fail to recognize the hazard, but if then why? To identify this root cause of the, the, the hazard recognition failure, maybe we can use some more wearable technologies like eye trackers or the EEG. For example, the eye tracking technologies, uh, it can track, it can uh, the monitor the eye movement so that it can tell us, that, tell us where they are looking at which means that if they don't see some hazard area, it is a problem. So if we collect the data from the multiple workers, maybe we can understand, uh, we, can, we can identify some may fail looking at spe a specific hazard. If then, we may need to provide some training to the workers to improve the hazard recognition capability. So this kind of some eye tracking uh, technologies uh, can provide us some idea on how to better improve the, the hazard recognition some beha behavior. And also we can use some wearable EEG sensors, uh, but the, maybe it is not easy to collect some EEG sensor data from the old uh, construction workers, because as you can see here, there are some mobile types of wireless EEG sensors so that we can, uh, the, the EEG is kind of brain signals. So that by analyzing the DCEG signals, uh, we can measure some workers' attention or some mental fatigue, some emotional status. Because 
So this kind of some uh, bad emotion status or the very high stressful some status could lead to some accident. So that measuring this EEG signals and by analyzing it, we can also identify potential safety issues. But of course, it is not easy to uh, use the these sensor for the all the older workers because the using the sensors may interfere with the ongoing work. But uh, by collecting the data from the, some sampled workers, we can better understand when they are uh, would be exposed to excessive mental demand. So then we can take on actions to reduce uh, those kinds of some mental demand uh, by uh, taking some appropriate uh, interventions. Okay, the, the, this now the, the last part of the presentation is re regarding some remaining challenges in the future direction. Always uh, collecting the data using the wearable sensors could have some privacy and the data security issues because physiological data or some other some uh, behavioral data, it is quite private data. So when I collect that, when I try to collect the data from the workers uh, for the, some field test, uh, it was quite not easy because many workers uh, <laughs> did not <laughs> want to wear those kind of sensors. So even in practice, uh, it is quite uh, some challenging issues. Another issue is that if we collect the data, maybe workers may feel like uh, they are being monitored all the time. So do you like, do you want to be monitored all the time while you are, while you are working? Maybe you may not want to do that. So this is another issue so that uh, I always try to persuade the workers like uh, this data will be only used for self-monitoring so that we're going to provide this data to only to you for the self-regulation of the some demand in construction work. So another issue is the human variability. So uh, construction workers these days, the construction workers are quite aging. And uh, there are some many workers from some, you know, some the, there are many international workers as well. So that the data collected from the census uh, may, uh, could have many some variability that could lead to some miss, uh, some identification of some specific, uh, some hazard. So that we may need to collect some more da data to generalize over some different population existing in the construction workforce. And finally, I will use both the computer vision and the wearable sensors. And I found that there are some pros and cons. For example, the vision data provides a rich information, but has some, some limitation. And the wearable sensors, it is quite useful to collect a specific, some, uh, some modality data, but to collect some different types of data, we need to use the different types of sensors. And Maybe workers may not want to use the sensors on the heart, the wrist, bend, and chest, etc. So that we may need to combine the, these two approaches together to better collect some data uh, to identify any some work-related issues. So toward the, I'm 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 calling this one is total same understanding through some data fusion. So if then there would be some remaining some technical issues like how to combine the different modality data to extract some useful information. This would be some another some research challenges. But I, I strongly believe that these kind of challenges can be solved in the near future. And the, in our industry, whenever I talk with the industry practitioners, they really uh, they are really interested in using this kind of technologies because of its great potential to improve the construction work. But for the, some practical use of these technologies, we may need to do some more some validation in practice with more some, some samples uh, to get some more reliable data. And I, also I strongly believe that the use of this kind of wearable technologies uh, can handle some of uh, the work uh, labor shortage issues by improving some construction performance as well. Okay, this is all about my presentation. Maybe I think the Q&A session will be done after doing all the presentation together, right? So okay, uh, thank you. For, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Juno, for your very informative presentation. Um, we can do the Q&A now, but just in case the audience uh, have any, you know, hot and burning issues to ask you.
Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. can can you take you know in case uh, let, let's just ask the uh, audience. Uh, does anyone have any question to ask um, Dr. Xu? You can just uh, you know switch on your mic and then and talk. And also maybe oh, okay yeah hello please go on. Okay, uh, Please thank go you. On. Okay, thank you, Professor Li Han, and uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Xin Tao Liu. I'm <clears throat> assistant professor in LSGI. I have uh, just a quick question. So you mentioned that in your future research, you will consider the total uh, context of the sensing data. Yes. So uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, how to consider the spatial context? Uh, for example, when you collect the, the eye tracking data in the indoor environment, and when you collect the um, eye tracking data in the outdoor environment, although the two data may be very similar to each other, so how do you can incorporate the different spatial context in your research? Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you for your interesting questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, I totally uh, yeah, I did agree with your opinion because the, the data collected from the these sensors uh, may need may have a different totally different context, for example, indoor and outdoor, and also depending on the types of tasks. For example, during the con uh, like a concrete work, there will be very many different materials. And but once the con structural work is done, now we're gonna do some finishing work in the very confined area. So that collect data collected from the sensors uh, would be affected by the environmental some, some conditions. So that, I, for example, if we want to use some eye tracking data, we need to obtain, also we need to know the contextual information regarding the environment. So that maybe we, may, we can use some this kind of vision data to understand some context, to extract some contextual information. So as an example, so I, I so far I've I've never combined the, this eye tracking data with the vision, but so it, I'm sorry, it's too small. But if you see the this one, you can see the different colors. So different color means the different types of the material or different types of the construction entities. For example, this is a fence, and this is equipment, and this is some safety fence or some this is some or some tools, etc. So that if we are using the vision based data, we can extract some contextual information. And if we did combine with eye tracking data here, because eye tracking data can only give us where they are looking at, but we don't know where the, what they are looking at. So to understand this one, we need to manually check that data. But if we combine the vision data <laughs> with this eye tracking data, maybe we can better understand some contextual information. Yeah. I hope okay, you answer your question. Thank you. thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Oh, thank you, Juno. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yes, please. If you have any questions, just speak up. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for the lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, I have just a very quick question. Um, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about using wearable sensor for collecting data, uh, if I understand clearly, I think from this slide, it showed that you use like um, Apple Watch to collect the data. Yes. And uh, I'm wondering uh, how uh, you're able to collect the real-time data from the um, Apple Watch. Um, how, how is the data recorded? Yeah, okay. Probably it's quite a technical question. Yeah, probably you know the Apple Watch. So unfortunately, Apple Watch doesn't provide the acceleration data in real time at the moment. <laughs> So I don't know, they block the real time the data transfer. I don't know why. So that at, so in this field test, I've collected the data. So I we developed some app, the Apple Watch app by ourselves. And this app will store the data during the work. And then after finishing the old work, we collected this Apple Watch and they extracted the data. So the unfortunate the Apple Watch itself doesn't provide the real time data, but there are some other types of the wristband that can that can provide some real time acceleration data, so that we can uh, do the, some, this kind of action recognition or the the you know the, the the real time. Yeah, I hope this answers oh, okay. your question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think in case you have. Uh, 
Uh, more questions uh, we can leave to the end of this um, you know session at the end of this uh, you know seminar um let's now invite uh, the second speaker dr uh yan tao yu uh, yan tao did uh, her phd at poly U, actually um then um, she joined uh, the hong kong university of science and technology. This is a very good evidence to show that PolyU is very doing very good research in our area. Um, Yan Tao has done a lot of work in understanding the you know uh, physical fatigue and then human uh, motion, and also he she actually quantified the relationship between emotion and the fatigue. Uh, with no further ado, let's invite Yan Tao. Are you ready, Yan Tao? Yes. So, can I screen now? Yeah, yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. So, so, thank you, Professor Henley, for, uh, for your invitation and for your introduction. So, today I'd like to share my works about using variable sensors for construction workers' behavioral uh, analysis. So, I will mainly focus on two topics. The first one is about construction workers physical fatigue assessment and the second one will be uh, measuring construction workers labor inputs using uh, sensors so let's start the first topic it is automatic physical fatigue assessment for construction workers using computer vision and the pressure in so sensor background. We know that construction workers are faced with very high workloads, and the reasons include the very high physical demanding task and confined workspaces, prolonged duration, and also insufficient break. And in addition, the aging workforce and manpower shortage has made, uh, have made things even worse. For example, in Hong Kong, we have over we have uh, about half of the workers, uh, they were actually over uh, 50 years old. And also for manpower shortage, we are facing a very severe uh, manpower shortage in the industry. And also physical fatigue has uh, caused a lot of uh, problems in our industry around the world, including uh, injuries, absence from work, accidents, and even death. So in order to increase the efficiency and to decrease the injury risk, we need to prevent physical fatigue. And the very first step for physical fatigue prevention is physical fatigue assessment. So now let's review the current physical fatigue assessment techniques. So the first uh, method would be manual record. So it is just like uh, it's shown here. Uh, so it is the most conventional method. Um, and it is usually based on pen and paper. And usually the uh, researchers will ask, ask the workers to report their feelings about fatigue and based on such a scale. And the methods are easy to implement, but the collected data might be subjective because it is based, based on the workers subjective feelings. So, uh, so such subjective data might result in biased results. And the second types of method is using variable sensors. So in physical fatigue assessment, we usually use uh, variable sensors as shown in the second picture. Uh, it can provide accurate and objective raw data, but the method can be really intrusive. So you can look at the second picture. In this experiment, I use five electrodes to measure the physical fatigue of only two muscles of the worker. So you can imagine if we want to measure the whole body fatigue of a construction worker, how many electrodes we will need to attach to the worker's skin. So it will be not suitable for uh, on-site application. And the third type of methods are vision-based methods. So as shown in the third picture, a depth camera can estimate the worker's 3D skeleton, and then the researchers can assess their physical fatigue or the ergonomic workload using ergonomic skills uh, according to their uh, working uh, postures. So these methods are usually accurate, objective, and also non-invasive. But because some depth camera are based on uh, infrared signals, uh, they are very sensitive to the direct sunlight. So depth cameras can only be used in indoor environments. But we know that actually a lot of construction, in our industry, a lot of work sites are, are actually located in outdoor environments, right? So we don't think this method could be used in outdoor work sites. Um, and also another limitation lies in that it, it is not individualized. Because it is, 
uh, the ergonomic skills are usually based on the posture data. And we know that different people might have different feelings of fatigue, even when they are performing the same uh, postures. So such methods may result in biased results. And also, some ergonomic skills are usually more suitable for the activities which are repetitive or last for a long period of time. And such limitations on working patterns are obviously not suitable for uh, our construction tasks, task, which are more flexible. So here we have identified two research gaps here. The first gap is about the physical fatigue assessment indicator. So the current indicators, they have uh, limit, limitations on work patterns, and also they are not individualized for personalized physical fatigue assessment. And also uh, the second gap is about data collection method. The current data collection methods are inaccurate, invasive, and only suitable for indoor environments. So, to, uh, so, uh, so based on the above research gaps, we have the following objectives. So first, we want to uh, we, we aim to establish a quantitative and individualized physical fatigue indicator, so which is which should be suitable for uh, irregular or complex construction activities. And the second type, the second objective is about data collection methods. They should be accurate. They should be non-invasive, and also they should be suitable for outdoor environment. And finally, we need to test whether the proposed method is accurate and feasible for the construction sites. And now let's move on to the methodology part of the, of the project. So to satisfy the research objectives about physical fatigue assessment indicator, we introduce physical fatigue model from biomechanics. Uh, as shown here. But we introduced this uh, model, and uh, it is based on the joint talks. And to calculate the joint talks, we need to uh, we need posture data and external force data. And remember that uh, our research objectives about data collection method, we want the data collection method to be uh, non-invasive, accurate, and automatic. So for posture data, we want to use computer vision technologies to help us to collect relevant data. And for external false data, um, as Dr. Steele just introduced, uh, we use pressure pre uh, insole pressure sensor here, which is relatively not so invasive and also can provide uh, like false related data. So here we got such a research outline. It includes four steps with the first step, uh, with the first task is collecting 3D posture data from 2D images using computer vision. And then we want to estimate the external loads or external forces using pressure insoles. And in task three, we need to calculate the joint talks using the pose data and external force data. And finally, in step four, we will, uh, we will employ the biomechanical model to establish an indicator and to calculate the uh, physical fatigue assessment uh, level. Okay, so now let's move on to first the task. It is 3D working posture estimation. It is actually a deep learning task. And the classical four steps of a deep learning task are, are shown here. The first one is establish a data set, then uh, build an architecture, and then training the network, and finally we will evaluate the network. So now let's see how we uh, build the data set. So first we use MU sensors, which is inertial measurement unit a very widely used uh, sensor to collect pulse data. Uh, so we will use MU sensors to collect the joint positions. Then the data was centralized, uh, normalized, and projected to 2D poses. And then we packed the 2D pulse data and the 3D pulse data uh, and got a such a data set. It includes uh, more than 67,000 uh, samples. And each sample is actually uh, a vector uh, consist consisting of 17, 76 elements. So with the first 30 element represents the 2D coordinates of 15 joints, and, uh, and the next 45 elements are representing the 3D pose data, and the last element is the test name. And here is the network architecture, so it is, it is shown here. The input of the network is a 30-dimensional 30, 30 vector, uh, which is actually the 2D skeleton. It's a 45 dimensional vector, uh, which is actually 3D a skeleton. And you may find that the network is, includes three modules the input module, register module, and output module. 
and the uh, the network uh, is actually uh, consisting of uh, three different types of layers. There are fully connected layer, functional layer, and activation layer. Oh, and also there are very two important parameters here. It is L and N. So the L means the number of neurons in each layer. It controls the the the, the, the it controls um, the width of the network, and for N it. it and represents here the number of residual units in the residual module, and it controls the depth of the network. So L and N together to control the complexity of the network. So here we define the loss function as the mean square error, and also we use the mean per joint position error to measure the accuracy of the pulse estimation. And after that, we train the network so we try different complexity, we try different learning rate, and also we've tried a different batch size. And after that, we compare the, uh, the, the training results and their different settings. So for complexity, we compare the training loss, validation loss, validation error, and validation time. And you can, if you look at the, uh, the, the horizontal axis, we have nine different complexities here. So, this are, so there are actually nine different combinations of the L and the N. So for L, we tried uh, 512, uh, 1024, and 2048. And for N, we tried two, uh, three, and four. So we compared the results of nine different complexity, and uh, here shows the results. So uh, for training loss, uh, for training loss, you may find that uh, there is no uh, obvious, not no uh, obvious differences among the complexities. And also for validation error, also we cannot find a lot of different difference here. And but for uh, validation for validation error, oh sorry here for the validation error, you may find that uh, the network with 1,024 neural layers and the two residual units uh, gives us the lowest validation error. So we select uh, this one, uh, this complexity here as the uh, as the complexity we will use uh, in our network. Also, we compared a different learning rate, and we tried like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and so on. And also, we compared these four uh, parameters. And uh, according to the results, it, it is very obvious that we need to select set the learning rate as 0 0.001 because it gives us the lowest training loss, the lowest validation loss, the short, uh, the lowest validation error, and also a relatively uh, short valid uh, validation time. Similarly, for batch size, we will, uh, after a comparison, we will set batch size as 64. So after, so about is the process of network training, and now we will evaluate the network uh, performance on the test data side. So uh, the figure on the left is the main project position error of all the samples in the test data side. So each point here represents the error of a uh, of, 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 uh, uh, Sample. And the figure on the right is the distribution of the error. So we may found that the mean error is about 1.26 centimeter and the standard deviation is about 0.43 centimeter. So this is actually a little bit lower than the results of other 3D pulse estimation works in the computer science community. So we think uh, the accuracy is uh, relatively uh, satisfying. So this uh, slide shows the results in a more intuitive way. It could be observed that the method could successfully estimate 2D postures and then infer, uh, infer 3D poses here. So it proves that it also proves that our method is suitable for uh, after door construction side videos. Okay, so about is the first task. Now let's look at the second task. It is to measure the external forces with smart insoles. Uh, the insoles are actually insole shaped pressure sensor. So you can see the figures here. So each of the insoles includes 30, uh, 13 pressure sensors. And when the worker wears the insole in their shoes, the insoles could measure the ground direction forces. And then by detecting the worker's weight, we could get forces in hands. So now we obtained the external force estimation here. And we also did a, a pilot study to test the accuracy of the external force measurement method. 
So here we ask the workers to hold zero, one, two, three, or four bricks. And here each bar corresponding to the total ground reaction forces. And the differences between two adjacent bars are represent the, the weights of the brick. So, uh, so according to the results, we got the estimation error of the brick weight uh, is about uh, four, is about five percent. Okay, so the third task is to, cal to calculate the joint toss. Uh, to this end, we have obtained the three D uh, posture data and the external force data. And in this task, we will use this data to calculate joint tops according to force and tops balance equilibrium. And in addition, we also estimate the, uh, the maximum joint top capacities here, uh, which will be used in the next task. And the maximum joint top capacity is estimated uh, according to the age, gender, weight, and the height, and the value of the coefficients are given in this table. Finally, we assess joint fatigue using a biomechanic model. So here is the math uh, mathematical representation of the model. The input includes the joint torque history here, and it is calculated according to the posture and external force data. And also the input includes the maximal, maximum joint capacity. It is calculated using the equation in the last slide. And the output is your current joint capacity. So in biomechanics, the decrease of your joint capacity is defined, it re actually represents your physical fatigue level. So in this research, we will use the ratio of your current joint capacity uh, in your uh, maximum joint capacity as your physical fatigue indicator. So uh, about is the methodology. And in the next part, we will validate the accuracy and the feasibility of the method on construction sites. So first, we use a laboratory experiment to test the accuracy of the uh, method. So here we use heart rate as the ground uh, to, uh, to provide the ground truth value of the fatigue level. And also we ask workers to conduct a material handling task here. And the results is shown in the slide. And each figure corresponds to each participant and uh, we have four, the results of four participants here. So in each figure, the red line represents the heart rate and the, well, well, the uh, blue line represents the results of the proposed method. So we can find that uh, these two lines have very similar variance. So we can conclude that the proposed method could reflect the physical fatigue level. And then we use field experiment to test the feasibility of the method on construction sites. And here we use two tasks, a scaffolding task and a masonry task. So here gives us the results. The figure on the left is the results of the scaffolding task. And the figure on the right is the masonry task. So in both figures, the X axis is time and Y axis representing your current joint level physical fatigue. And the eight lines correspond to your eight joints. So this figure shows that our method could provide quantitative and continuous physical fatigue assessment on real construction sites. Okay, so in addition, we also explore some potential application scenarios. And in the first study, we explored the influence of uh, construction site layout and fatigue level. So here we change the distance between the storage area and the working area. So you may found that the physical fatigue level will also change uh, will also change according to the different uh, set layouts. And also we try uh, the influence of work rest schedule on the physical fatigue level. So here we, uh, we, we, we change the rest time um, after the worker finishing one layer of the wall. So you may find also we can provide uh, very accurate results here. Okay, so about is the it is my PhD study about how to assess physical fatigue, how to assess physical fatigue for of construction workers using sensing technologies. So the contribution is that we provide a new indicator for worker uh, physical fatigue assessment, which is individualized, quantitative, and also has no limitations on worker pattern. And the second contribution is that we provide new types of construction worker data, like their posture data. Planter pressure data, and also their joint angles and the joint tops. 
And also we train the first algorithm to estimate 3D working cultures for construction workers. And in spite of about, uh, about uh, distribution, the, 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 the methodology still has some limitations here. So consider the first limitation is about pulse data collection methods. So in this method, we use camera to collect pulse data. But uh, as Dr. Sue just mentioned, there exists a privacy issues here because you actually, if you were the worker, you will definitely do not want to be captured when you were working, right? And also for, but if we try to, but if we collect the pulse data using uh, MU or inertial measurement units, uh, we need to attach uh, multiple sensors to the worker's body. So it is very intrusive and may not be, uh, may not be applicable to construction activities. And another limitation is about false data collection. So when we collect the ground direction forces, so actually currently we only consider the vertical forces. So, but we also know, but we all know that actually the ground direction forces has three direction. It's actually a three dimensional vector, right? But currently we only consider the vertical force. So maybe in the future we need we need to develop more algorithms to estimate um, uh, the, the forces in two other in the other two directions. And another uh, limitation last thing is the battery life and also the data transmission uh, function. Because if we want to provide real-time data, we will need to get the data uh, in a real-time manner, which means we need to transmit the data to your smartphone or to some other um, uh, devices in real time. So this will increase the energy consumption of the uh, insole. So now we may need to um, have some like self-power technologies here, and also now we only uh, and also now we only consider the forces acting on uh, on on face. But also it is very common that on uh, construction sites the workers will will also uh, there are there are also some forces acting on workers' hands. But now we still like a a a a still like a sensors to collect the forces or pressure data on hands. So considering the topic is our wearable technologies, so we may consider uh, to solve these limitations uh, using wearable technologies here. So one possible solution might be uh, using some flexible sensors here, like, uh, like tactile sensors. So tactile sensing is an important human worker behavior data, and it includes very useful information about uh, human worker behavior analysis and robotic hand control. But previous studies about worker behavior and construction robot sensing mainly focus on their motion data. So one of the future direction might be to apply tactile sensing data or, uh, or e-skin to collect tactile sensing data during the construction tasks. And the e-skin refers to uh, flexible, stretchable, and self-healing electronics that are able to mimic the functionalities of our human hands, uh, like sensing the pressure or sensing the motion. And the such sensing data will uh, actually include motion data and the pressure data. So it will help us in future studies about workers' behavioral analysis and also um, workers, uh, and also like uh, research related to construction robotics. Okay, so about the first study. The second study will be about measuring labor inputs. Uh, uh, it is actually to counting construction activities using MU on hand tools. So uh, as I just introduced, MU sensors are, are uh, if we attach MU sensors to worker bodies, it will be very intrusive. So it's very natural to consider that what if we attach MU sensors to tools? Actually, nowadays, many construction tasks are performed with tools. And if we attach an MU sensor to these tools, it may enable us to track and record the use process of hand tools. And it may also help us to reveal some motion patterns of construction workers, right? So one interesting topic is that we may found that most of the construction activities, uh, especially those uh, conducted using these tools are highly repetitive. So maybe we can um, calculate the uh, measure the labor inputs automatically and not invasively uh, using the data collected by the MU sensors attached on the uh, construction tools. So for example, here we list the four repetition uh, four repetition patterns of worker motions here. 
So here we propose a reputation out, uh, estimation algorithm. So we need to first convert signals into suitable feature sequence for data augmentation. And also we propose a temporal self -sim uh, similarity matrix and uh, like this one. After that, we segment the sequences and the counting the reputation for labor impulse measurements. So here is the results of a pilot study uh, about a screw connection task with wrench. So as shown in this figure, you may find that uh, we can extract some features and also we can formulate a self-similarity matrix here. And you may find there are numerous blocks in this matrix. Actually, they revealed the reputation pattern of the motion of, uh, of the uh, MUs or of the, of the tools. And based on these blocks, we can uh, counting the reputations so that we can uh, uh, count, count the reputations of the uh, range of the motions of the range so we can calculate uh, counting the reputation of worker motion and this may help us to measure their uh, productivity. Okay, so a bell is all of my uh, presentation today. So uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yan Tao, for your. Uh a detailed and um, you know dynamic talk. Um, can okay. There's a question from uh, Henry Lau to everyone. Thank, thanks. Could you elaborate? Uh, let me just read it out. Could you elaborate how to get 2D data? Open po open post question. So oh. Yan Tao, there's a question for you. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, for, Henry, for a question. Uh, yes, I. First, I use open polls to collect 2D data polls, uh, 2D polls data first. And then my work is to estimate 3D polls data according to the 2D polls data. So actually I found open polls are somehow, it, it, uh, how to say, it is, uh, works well in applying, uh, if we apply it to estimate the 2D poses uh, uh, according to the construction videos. But the problem lies in that sometimes when the workers when the worker's body is occluded, the 2D, then in, um, in such cases, the open pulse may fail to provide very accurate uh, uh, pulse estimation results. So maybe in the future, we may consider to, uh, to, uh, to develop somehow occlusion uh, tolerant pulse estimation data for construction sites. So I hope I, uh, my answer, I hope uh, I have answered your question. Thank you. Okay, um, further questions from audience? Do you want to ask anything else? If no, then um, I think we, we can leave uh, some, you know, few minutes at the end for more questions. Um, now we invite uh, the third speaker, Dr. Uh, Luo Xiaowei. Xiaowei is a social professor at the City University, uh, working in the civil and architectural engineering department. Xiaowei got the PhD from um, University of Texas Austin, which is uh, you know fairly well known for their construction management, teaching and research programs. Xiaowei is a, a very productive researcher in our field. You know he published extensively in our field, and he also he has. Um, been very successful in obtaining research grants from RGC and the NSFC and so on. Okay, um, with no further ado, let's invite uh, Dr. Luo Xiaowei. Xiaowei. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Professor Li. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Professor Li and Professor Pao for uh, inviting me to uh, give a presentation on these seminars. So uh, I'm Xiaowei Luo from uh, CTU. And uh, right now, uh, I'm a uh, associate professor at CTU. And uh, meanwhile, I also uh, actively participate in uh, other community services. For example, uh, I act as the conveners of a community of practice for sustainability in CTU. And also, uh, right now, I'm the council members of uh, the Chinese uh, Association of Young Scientists and Technologies, as well as uh, serving as uh, the treasurers in ASE Greater China sections. And uh, my current research uh, interests focus on uh, construction management, uh, including uh, safety management, and also how uh, do we apply 
the sensing and information technologies uh, to construction management. And also another uh, areas that we are working right now is on uh, robotics and uh, virtual uh, realities in constructions, as well as uh, the uh, building energy management and resiliency. So in today's uh, presentations, I will uh, focus on uh, the safety management uh, for constructions. So uh, we will not uh, cover other areas that I'm working on. So this is uh, the presentation outline for today's uh, presentations. So first, uh, I will uh, briefly talk about uh, the research background. Since uh, Professor uh, So and uh, Professor Yu has already uh, mentioned a lot of background. So I will uh, just briefly uh, talk about it. And then uh, the second part is uh, we will go in to, uh, to see how do we uh, monitor the workers' behaviors and do the environmental monitoring for uh, constructions as well as uh, the operations. And uh, lastly, after uh, we take a look at uh, the research work that has been conducted by our team and other researchers, we will uh, summarize some of uh, the research challenge and also indicate the future research that we can work on related to uh, wearable uh, sensors for constructions. Okay, so uh, here uh, shows uh, the uh, comparisons between uh, construction industries and the mobile industries uh, 100 years ago. So uh, 100 years ago, that is around uh, 1910, here shows uh, two construction job sites in the uh, United States. So that uh, you can see that uh, at that time, there are already uh, tow cranes, uh, excavators, and other uh, machineries that are on construction job sites. And um, meanwhile, if we take a look at uh, the mobile uh, manufacturers industries, so here shows uh, the Ford uh, factories in the uh, United States uh, 90 uh, years ago. So uh, you can see that at that time, a lot of uh, those uh, activities that actually are conducted manually. So 100 years uh, already uh, passed. So any changing to these uh, two industries? So here, uh, we will take a, here are uh, some pictures taken from uh, the construction job site and the uh, uh, mobile industries these days. So you can see that on the left-hand side, still on the uh, construction job site, uh, they're using uh, the similar technologies as before, like uh, the tile cranes, uh, excavators, mobile cranes, and et cetera. But uh, if you take a look at the um, automobile industries, you will find out that uh, there are less uh, labors in the factories. So that uh, a lot of them, they're actually uh, replaced by the robots. And uh, the uh, construction industries are uh, uh, insecure in the uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, they uh, conducted a productivity analysis in uh, 2015. And then found out that uh, actually the uh, non-construction, uh, in non-construction industries, the productivity is uh, increasing in the past uh, uh, 50 years. But uh, for the construction uh, industries, the uh, productivity is actually decreasing. So why, why is the reason behind? So uh, they also uh, analyzed uh, the reason behind. They found out that uh, in the construction industries, the uh, digitalization uh, levels is uh, relative uh, low comparing to other industries. So here uh, in this uh, matrix, it shows uh, the uh, industry digitalization index that is uh, developed by McKenzie in uh, 2017. So uh, here, uh, the red one means uh, it is less digitalized and that a uh, green one means uh, more digitalized. And you will find out that uh, the construction industries is uh, one of uh, the lowest uh, digitalized uh, industries in uh, across all those uh, industries. And uh, also uh, in the uh, construction industries, as you uh, can see that, the uh, aging uh, populations is uh, increasing in the uh, past uh, several years. So, uh, you find uh, doing uh, prelim uh, studies, we found out that uh, on the construction uh, job site, like uh, 10 years ago, the average uh, age of those uh, construction workers is around uh, 35. And uh, 10 years later, then uh, the uh, average age is uh, uh, a little bit uh, larger than uh, 40 years old. So it means that uh, 
the newcomers in these industries is uh, not that uh, uh, many comparing to uh, uh, other industries. So a lot in, uh, in the futures, uh, a lot of uh, those uh, aging uh, workers, they will uh, retire in the futures. So for example, like uh, the construction uh, industries uh, console in Hong Kong, they uh, predict that nearly uh, 190,000 uh, construction workers might be retired in the next uh, 10 years. So there will be a shortage of uh, the construction uh, labors in the industries. So how do we uh, deal with uh, that? So uh, the industries and the governments uh, propose the ideas of uh, smart constructions. So like uh, the uh, uh, ministries of uh, urban uh, development and constructions in uh, mainland China, they uh, mentioned that we will need to uh, increase the digitalization level of uh, the construction uh, industries. And then uh, also uh, in different um, uh, university, they also set up the smart constructions uh, majors to uh, cultivate those uh, uh, future workforce that are able to uh, conduct the smart construction uh, work. So what is uh, smart constructions? So uh, the smart constructions is uh, actually the industry 4.0 uh, in the construction uh, sectors. So uh, they uh, include uh, different uh, technologies in it like uh, robotics, uh, big data, augmented realities, uh, cloud computing, uh, IoT, and uh, et cetera. So a lot of uh, stakeholders in the industries, they're actually uh, working on uh, this, uh, on the digitalization of our uh, construction industries. For example, like uh, one Japanese uh, companies, they use uh, the uh, Boston Dynamics uh, spot robot to uh, do the uh, job site inspections on site. And also uh, Hutis, uh, they uh, develop those uh, robots to uh, do the uh, drilling work to replace uh, the humans. So uh, they use uh, the tele uh, operators of uh, the robots on site. And also, uh, as you can see that uh, at different uh, construction job sites, they also uh, install a lot of uh, those uh, surveillance cameras to do the uh, job site uh, monitoring. And also uh, like this is uh, do some uh, excavators uh, companies in uh, Korea. They also uh, developed the autonomous uh, construction uh, robots. And also, uh, as you might heard that uh, Baidu and uh, Tongxin, they're also uh, working on uh, smart constructions. So in the uh, construction uh, industry, the safety, uh, it is uh, one of uh, the critical uh, index of our construction industry's uh, performance. The uh, safety performance in the industries is not satisfactory in the last uh, uh, decades. So as you can see that uh, in here, uh, the construction of fertilities actually uh, do not uh, decrease significantly in the last uh, decades. And uh, as mentioned by uh, the uh, president of uh, mainland China, uh, he mentioned that uh, the uh, economic uh, developments cannot uh, sacrifice the uh, life. So we need to uh, focus on the work safety. And uh, in the uh, current uh, construction uh, practice, uh, they really uh, focus on uh, the fatal accidents and other accidents. And then uh, according to the uh, incident uh, primers, a large uh, numbers of uh, near accidents and first aid injuries are actually uh, behind those uh, fatals and the uh, uh, absence uh, accidents. So that if we want to uh, improve uh, the construction uh, safety, we need to uh, focus on those uh, details uh, things, like uh, to reduce the near uh, accidents and the first aid uh, injuries. So by reducing uh, those uh, accidents, we can uh, reduce the fatal accidents and also uh, the absence from work incidents. So uh, how the accidents uh, happens on the construction job site. So uh, here shows uh, the chain uh, series of uh, construction uh, accidents. So first, uh, uh, you need to have other unsafe uh, conditions on the side. This is about uh, the environment. And then uh, if uh, the unsafe conditions exist and also uh, the humans, they uh, behave unsafely, then uh, they might cause uh, the near miss uh, accidents. And then uh, out of uh, 100 uh, near miss uh, accidents, they might uh, cause some uh, fatals or injuries. 
So uh, to uh, improve uh, the safety on the uh, construction side, we want to eliminate the unsafe uh, conditions and also reduce the unsafe act of other uh, uh, workers. So that, uh, that result in the environmental monitoring and the uh, human behavior monitoring. So uh, in the past, we use uh, the manual observations to do these uh, monitoring, but with uh, the uh, advancement of uh, information technologies, we can actually apply different sensors to do the monitoring. So uh, the first uh, set of uh, data is uh, the workers related data. So workers are related data can also be uh, divided into uh, different types. So uh, the first type is about the uh, uh, psychological uh, data. So uh, those include uh, the uh, cognitive load and uh, fatigue and uh, others that are mentioned by Dr. So and Dr. Yu uh, before. So uh, like as we mentioned in the past, uh, they use uh, those uh, questionnaires to uh, survey the task load of other uh, uh, workers. However, if you use uh, those questionnaires, it cannot uh, capture the uh, workers' uh, task load uh, in real time. And then also this is uh, uh, just uh, based on humans' uh, perceptions. They might not uh, accurately monitor those uh, uh, task load. So that are uh, using uh, EEG, it can uh, provide one option to capture those uh, task load. And uh, the EEG uh, data, once you get the EEG data, you need to uh, process uh, those EEG data to get the uh, useful information out of uh, those data. So uh, in the uh, EEG uh, data analysis, uh, usually when you get those uh, data, you need to do the uh, down samplings, uh, filterings, epoching, and uh, artifacts uh, corrections and uh, et cetera. So the after uh, pre-processing the EEG data, then the next step is uh, you can do the uh, feature uh, instructions and select the features to do the uh, classifications to get those uh, useful information from EEG data. So one example uh, to use uh, the EEG data is that uh, we can use uh, the EEG to uh, monitor the workers' uh, distractions uh, in real time. So uh, in the past, uh, a lot of uh, those uh, accidents, they actually uh, happen because uh, uh, the workforce, they uh, switch their uh, attention to other activities instead of uh, the work they're working on. So, uh, for, so this uh, might cause uh, the uh, uh, injuries or accidents. So how do we uh, uh, alarm those uh, workforce if uh, they got distractions from their work? So that uh, in this research, we use uh, the EEG uh, sensors and then uh, ask the workers to wear the uh, EEG sensors. And then uh, by uh, doing uh, the uh, data pre-processing and uh, using the uh, features uh, selections approach and also compare it with uh, the uh, performance uh, data, we uh, successfully uh, re uh, get uh, a few index that can uh, be used to measure the distractions of the workforce. So uh, on the construction job side, if uh, those uh, index has exceed a certain levels, then uh, you can send the alarm to the workers to remind them the got distractions. And also those uh, information can be sent uh, to the uh, safety officers and also the back end to do the uh, further uh, data analysis. And uh, the uh, second type of uh, uh, worker-related uh, psychological data is uh, the eye movement data. So uh, Dr. So already uh, mentioned uh, the uh, eye movement data. They can uh, be uh, captured using uh, the eye uh, trackers. Like uh, the uh, eye trackers can be uh, on uh, mounted on the computers, or it can also be uh, integrated in the virtual reality uh, 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 devices. So uh, in these uh, papers, uh, we uh, critically reviewed uh, those uh, different uh, uh, technologies and also uh, the methodologies uh, for processing those uh, eye tracking data. So in uh, our studies, uh, uh, we use uh, the eye tracking uh, devices a lot to capture uh, the safety index of uh, those workers. For example, in these uh, studies, we uh, developed uh, uh, virtual reality uh, scenarios using uh, Bing software and then uh, deploy them on the uh, HTC Vive to ask uh, the uh, students and the construction workers 
to uh, assess the hazards, to uh, identify the hazards in those uh, scenarios. So that uh, using uh, the virtual realities, uh, we are able to uh, differentiate what is uh, the difference between uh, the uh, new uh, comers to the industries and the experienced uh, workers in the industries so that uh, we uh, can uh, provide the insight for the safety trainings to um, pinpoint what would be uh, the uh, lack of our safety knowledge or the uh, abilities in those uh, newcomers and how they can uh, learn from those uh, experienced uh, workers and safety officers. And uh, nowadays, uh, the uh, robotics has been uh, widely used in the construction industries. How However, uh, in uh, the short term, you might not be able to see uh, the fully automatic construction site. So uh, in a long period, you will see uh, the humans and the robot, they might work together on the construction site. So for the humans, uh, if you want to prevent the uh, misjudgments, you need to uh, let the human understand the robot's uh, intention. And also the robot need to understand human's intentions so that uh, they, there will not be uh, any misjudgments in, uh, the, uh, in the decision makings. So using uh, the uh, EEG devices and uh, computer visions, uh, you can uh, do that. So uh, for example, uh, here, this is a research conducted by uh, Liu and uh, uh, Jubilees in uh, 2021. They use uh, the uh, EEG to actually uh, send a, a signal to the robots. So the robots uh, might understand the intentions of uh, the humans. And uh, for the uh, humans to understand the intentions of uh, the robots, this is also an active research in uh, computer science. And uh, another uh, type of uh, human-related uh, data is uh, the location data. And uh, uh, both our professors also uh, mentioned about uh, 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 locations uh, data. There exists a lot of uh, different technologies to do the uh, locations uh, data collections. However, how to uh, provide the accurate uh, indoor locations uh, information is still a challenge in our research and practice. So uh, to uh, tackle with uh, this gap, we propose a fusion-based uh, localization uh, algorithms that may use of uh, uh, the uh, data fusions from uh, different sensors and help to improve the accuracy of uh, the um, uh, localizations. So uh, here uh, shows that uh, this is uh, the uh, multi-source uh, fusions uh, localizations uh, performance. So uh, as you can see that uh, this uh, performance is uh, better than uh, the localizations using a single uh, sensor. And uh, we do the uh, test in uh, the lab and also uh, in uh, the uh, office environment to uh, simulate the actual environment on the construction site. And another uh, uh, data that uh, we need to collect for uh, the uh, workers is uh, the behaviors like uh, the skeletons mentioned uh, before. So uh, usually uh, we can use uh, the IMU's uh, sensor to uh, do those uh, uh, data collections. However, uh, using the IMU uh, sensors, as you can see uh, from these uh, pictures, uh, this is considered as an intrusive uh, uh, technology because uh, you need to ask the workers to wear those uh, different type of uh, IMU's. And then uh, the uh, workers, they might not feel uh, comfortable on it. And also uh, not to mention that a lot of uh, those sensors that actually are uh, made from rigid materials that are th then uh, these interactions between uh, the rigid materials and the soft skins might be awkward. So another uh, to uh, tackle with uh, these issues uh, in the uh, uh, research uh, communities, uh, many researchers also use uh, the deep sensors to capture the uh, 3D pose of uh, those uh, workers. And uh, in uh, our, uh, one of our research uh, last year, we uh, proposed uh, the uh, 2D to uh, 3D uh, lifting approach so that uh, we can uh, accurately uh, predict the 3D, uh, reconstruct the 3D pose based on a single uh, 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 image of uh, the workers. And uh, as 
we mentioned uh, the uh, interactions between uh, the um, soft skin and the rigid uh, materials of uh, the sensors might cause uh, some problems, like uh, the uh, uh, might increase uh, the uh, errors in the uh, data and exceptions. So that to solve uh, this issue, to uh, help uh, the uh, sensors can be attached to the skins uh, better. Then uh, in our uh, research with uh, mechanical engineering, we uh, developed these uh, pencil uh, ceramic uh, sensors that can uh, help to check uh, the movements of uh, the uh, neck and uh, the sections. So that uh, you can see that uh, you, uh, we developed this uh, prototype and test it in the lab. So uh, the performance is uh, quite uh, good. And uh, besides uh, the uh, human behaviors uh, data, another uh, type of data is about the environment. So uh, you can directly uh, capture those uh, environmental data using uh, the computer vision uh, uh, technologies. Like uh, those uh, technologies has been widely used in uh, the uh, surveillance cameras, uh, monitoring, and also uh, the uh, autonomous uh, vehicles driving. However, uh, there is no uh, common or complete construction uh, industries annotated uh, data set in the industries. And uh, the uh, data is uh, quite uh, limited. So that uh, in one of our research, uh, we propose uh, the transfer learning to solve uh, the uh, unavailabilities of a large uh, annotated uh, data in uh, the industries. So that uh, in, we use uh, the uh, Garrel as an example to uh, demonstrate the uh, performance of our method. And as you can see in these um, uh, tables, uh, the uh, accuracy of uh, the uh, proposed uh, method is uh, quite good. It's nearly over uh, 90%. And uh, using this uh, method, uh, we can uh, further extend it to uh, the uh, resource management on the construction job site. So for example, you can monitor uh, the machines, operations, and uh, uh, workers on uh, the job site. And um, once uh, the uh, computers, uh, they capture these uh, uh, visions of the objects in the image, you, uh, the computers might not know the uh, things behind. They might not, they just know this is uh, workers, this is a hard hat and this is uh, maybe uh, excavators. So uh, their relationship uh, is an unknown and how do they do the uh, reasoning still relies on uh, the human's uh, experts or human's knowledge. And uh, in the uh, recent, uh, in the existing uh, studies, many of them, they will hard code those uh, decision rules in uh, the software so that uh, they can do the uh, simple or straightforward reasoning based on that. And uh, in our studies, uh, we want uh, the computers to uh, understand this uh, knowledge or the thing behind uh, more easily. So that uh, we propose uh, the uh, job site behaviors uh, descriptions uh, based on uh, the computer visions. So in these um, uh, studies, uh, we propose a method and algorithms that can uh, help the computers to understand the thing behind uh, this uh, image. And then uh, later, uh, uh, these uh, things, uh, descriptions can be connected with uh, the knowledge graph that we develop based on uh, uh, safety uh, standards. And then uh, by combining the uh, descriptions and uh, uh, safety uh, uh, knowledge graph of our uh, constructions, then uh, the computers can automatically uh, do the reasoning to detect the unsafe behaviors in this uh, image. So you no longer need uh, the uh, safety officers to uh, seek in front of uh, those uh, monitors to uh, monitor the workers' uh, behaviors. Once uh, the computers, they uh, realize the unsafe behaviors, they will automatically send those uh, uh, message to the safety officers. And also, uh, if you have uh, any updated knowledge in uh, your safety standards, then uh, you, can, you just need to uh, put those uh, tests into uh, the, uh, our progress. So it will uh, regenerate the uh, knowledge graph and update the knowledge graph for you so that uh, they can uh, keep the uh, safety rules up to date. 
And uh, here uh, we also uh, test uh, the combinations and the fusions of uh, different uh, sensor data to do the uh, resonance. And uh, in these uh, studies, we uh, uh, integrate the position data and the posture uh, data together. And uh, it demonstrates that uh, by integrating multi-source uh, data, it can help to improve the decision-making performance. And uh, in the past uh, few uh, slides, we uh, talk about the uh, uh, data collections on the construction job site. And those uh, methods and the technologies can also be used for uh, the operational phase. But here give one example, like uh, in the uh, operational uh, phase, occupation, uh, occupants uh, evacuation behaviors is uh, very important for the uh, operational uh, safety. For example, in the past, if you go uh, to uh, the newspapers, uh, many times you will hear about uh, that uh, sometimes in a city or in a building, there is a fire. And uh, some of uh, the uh, residents, they might not be able to evacuate in uh, town and uh, they might uh, got uh, injured or even uh, died in this uh, uh, fire event. So uh, in uh, our studies, uh, we want to uh, analyze, further analyze the evacuation uh, behaviors of uh, those residents to understand how those uh, design uh, criteria can affect the evacuation uh, behaviors, how the uh, residents, they behave in uh, these uh, extreme uh, uh, situations so that uh, we uh, develop the uh, virtual reality uh, environment and then uh, use uh, the uh, VRs and uh, variable sensors to uh, capture and collect the data of uh, the, uh, uh, event, the uh, residents. And then uh, do the uh, analysis to analyze uh, those uh, uh, human behaviors. For example, uh, we use uh, the uh, VR uh, and eye tracking uh, devices to uh, analyze what would be the uh, impact of uh, the turning angles on the uh, human's uh, evacuation uh, performance. And it found out that uh, the uh, turning angles significantly affect uh, their uh, evacuation uh, behaviors. And this uh, can also provide the insight for uh, the uh, floor plan uh, de design in uh, the uh, uh, design phase of uh, the buildings. And um, last, uh, I would uh, like to briefly uh, talk about uh, the research uh, challenge that we found. And uh, the first challenge is uh, the interaction between uh, the rigid electronic uh, materials and the soft skin. So uh, as you can see that like the uh, IMUs, uh, the, uh, a lot of uh, other uh, sensors, they're actually uh, made of uh, those rigid electronic uh, materials. And uh, the unfit between uh, the soft skin and the electronic materials, they might uh, result in uh, the errors in those uh, data. So uh, one future research is uh, on the flexible uh, sensors or the uh, like the uh, skin, soft skin for uh, sensor uh, skins uh, that can uh, be uh, developed for uh, the construction uh, industries. And uh, the second uh, challenge has been uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Yu, that is uh, the high energy consumption of uh, those sensors. So uh, to tackle with uh, this uh, challenge, uh, there might be two uh, possible directions. The first uh, direction is uh, on the uh, average side. So for example, how do we uh, reduce the energy consumption of uh, those sensors? And uh, we can use uh, the advanced uh, routing uh, algorithms to reduce uh, the um, energies that are consumed in the communications. And also uh, we can uh, develop the uh, energy harvesting uh, technologies for uh, the, so that uh, it can harvest uh, the energies from the vibrations and accessories. This can help to uh, prolong the uh, battery life of other uh, sensors. And uh, the next uh, challenge is uh, the limited uh, sensing capacity. So as you can see that uh, currently for those uh, sensors used uh, in constructions, mostly uh, they will just uh, capture the uh, visual uh, image, maybe uh, the locations, uh, the uh, uh, skeleton, the postures and accessories. But uh, for the humans, human uh, ourselves, we can actually uh, sense a lot of uh, other uh, uh, data than uh, the existing sensors can do. For example, we can uh, smell those uh, environment, we can taste, uh, we can also uh, touch to uh, feel the uh, uh, textures 
of other materials. So uh, in the future, uh, we might need to use uh, those uh, uh, a varieties of our sensors with uh, different capacities, and then uh, to uh, uh, increase those uh, sensing capacities of uh, the uh, robots on construction job site. And uh, next is uh, data securities. And uh, a lot of other uh, data is collected on the job site or uh, on the humans. They actually are quite sensitive. How do we uh, protect those uh, data during the transmissions? This is uh, still a challenge in uh, the uh, construction uh, industries. And uh, last but not the least is uh, the uh, privacy management, which has been mentioned by uh, Dr. So. Like, uh, how do we uh, protect the privacy of uh, the uh, workers and the occupants? This is uh, also critical for the applications in construction. So that uh, I would like to uh, thank you for your uh, patience. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, raise your questions or discuss with us uh, later. Okay, thank you, Professor Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Xiao Wei, for your very interesting and very informative uh, you know, presentation. Um, you know, as you together with uh, uh, Dr. Seo and Yan Tao actually presented the state of art of construction research. Thank you so much. Now um, the, the, the floor is open to uh, audience. Um, you know, if you have question to Xiao Wei or anyone else, Please just speak out or, or, or write on the chat box. Thank you. While, while others are thinking, maybe as the convenient, maybe ask a, a question to all of you. Just give you, give three of you a few minutes to think. My question is, um, um, because uh, all the research disciplines are tackling fundament fundamental or ground challenges, you know, my question to you is, um, do you think uh, construction management has any ground challenge? Uh, if yes, what are, are they? Let's start with, Dr. Sill, in your opinion, what are the grand challenges in our field? Okay, um, yeah, probably the, the researchers who are working on the wear of sensors may encounter the many, many different challenges when they are developing their own systems. Uh, especially based on my experience, uh, one of the challenges I had was Existing wearable sensors are not that much designed for the construction applications. So that we may need to do some modification for the better use of the existing system. But for, from the, some practical, some purpose, we, we need to use the off the shelf some sensors like Apple Watch or the wristband or some other types of sensors. But in terms of the data collection and the processing, uh, sometimes we may not be access to the data from the, those kinds of sensors, so that it may hinder the use of these sensors on the off-the-shelf product in the practice. So I think that, uh, that this is the, what I had, in, uh, the, the, I, what I think is one of the some challenging some issues when we are adopting some wearable technologies. So maybe to tackle the, these issues, we may need to develop our own some product that can be some customized for our purpose. But also because we are not the, the mechanic, we are not in the mechanical engineering or the electronic engineering who are able to develop those kind of system. So then maybe down the road we may need to do some more collaboration with some other uh, domain uh, to develop some our own some customized some product to collect some data using the wearable sensors. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you so much, uh, Dr. Seo. I think uh, the research institute of uh, eyewear may help you. I think uh, you and anyone else who needs a new type of uh, sensor or new type of wearable sensor, you can, if you can 
clearly indicate your requirement and then the, the professor, the expert in this institute may be able to help you. And this is probably one of the purposes for, uh, you know, linking people like you up with this uh, institute. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, the same question goes to Yan Tao. So what do you think are the grand challenges in our field? Oh, I think the grand challenges may be related to new technologies or new, even new management methods. For example, we have modular integrated construction now, and this may raise new, new questions about uh, how can we manage the resources? This is about social science ground questions. And in terms of like uh, nature and science, uh, scientific questions, uh, the ground uh, contrib the, the, the original contribution may lies in that, how can we uh, modify some automatic uh, technologies to make it more suitable for like modular integrated construction. Uh, I think that's my uh, opinion. Yeah, so, but, so uh, with more and more uh, uh, new technologies emerging in our uh, industry, I think we will have more and more uh, new, new questions here. And as you previously told me that, actually we have no new questions now. So I think maybe the question, the, the, the original contribution may lie in some new solution here, yeah. Thank you, Yan Tao. Thank you. No, we, we, it's, it's our responsibility to, to continuously explore uh, yeah. new ways of improving a new, in your, in your case is to improve, to, to, um, design and um, and to develop new technologies so that we can build our buildings faster, cheaper, yeah. and <laughs> more user-friendly, <laughs> uh, environmental-friendly. Yeah. Well, yeah. that, that's definitely a, a challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, shall we, in your opinion, what is our grand challenges in our field? Okay, so uh, just my uh, five cents is that, uh, uh, the grand challenge in our uh, field uh, remains in uh, both technologies and uh, the management side. So uh, for the management side is that uh, how can we uh, improve uh, the management performance of uh, those uh, uh, our project, especially uh, for those uh, uh, challenging projects like uh, the uh, uh, mega projects and maybe uh, the space projects and the marine uh, undersea marine projects. So uh, this, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, technical uh, challenge and management uh, challenge there. And uh, the uh, second way is that uh, as, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, our industries, civil and construction industries is an applied discipline instead of uh, fundamental industries. So that uh, we need to uh, borrow the ideas from uh, different uh, uh, disciplines like uh, materials, uh, computer science, uh, mechanicals, and et cetera. And uh, how, how do we, uh, adapt those uh, technologies to fit the use of uh, our industries. That uh, remains another uh, challenge because uh, usually uh, if you just uh, uh, bring them to uh, our industries, you might not uh, find it uh, very useful because uh, uh, there's some uh, technical uh, uh, uniqueness in our industries. Like uh, some uh, technologies, they might work on the, uh, in the lab, but they might not work in the industries. And the second type is uh, even you have uh, those uh, technologies that can work on the side, but uh, how do you uh, uh, improve uh, the performance and actually uh, uh, in, uh, turn those uh, technologies into the values of uh, the industries? It also uh, need to uh, have other uh, uh, humans uh, collaborations and also uh, the business uh, flow uh, 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 adaptions so that uh, uh, the management uh, uh, systems might also uh, need to be changed. So I think uh, the technologies and management side are the grand challenge of our industry. Yeah, I, I thank you, Xiao Wei. Um, I, I know you have done a lot of work in adapting uh, very latest technologies to solving the problems in our industry. And also you work very closely with many people from different disciplines. I think you, you yourself is a role model for many of us to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, 
let's ask uh, the audience again, see if we have any questions or any suggestions uh, to us. You know, I know people in here in the audience have fo fo uh, total different backgrounds. Some probably are from our own domain, others from, you know, sensing technology or, 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 or even economics. I suggest that, uh, you know, for people who want to find, uh, uh, say, a, a test bed for your technology or, or you know, um, experimental ground, you should contact um, those speakers and contact us. And then uh, for people working in the construction industry who need a new technology, new sensing technology, you should contact the institute they may be able to help you. And then this is the purpose of, uh, you know, um, you know, running this, uh, organ this seminar so that we can know each other better. We can help each other to, you know, to encourage collaborations between us. Uh, if, no, if no questions from the audience, maybe because it's, it's been a long time, it's almost two hours now. Um, that's, uh, you know, once again, thank the three speakers for your for your time and effort and your excellent presentation. To me, your presentations are very inspiring and encouraging. And uh, thank you for your uh, contributions to this seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm not sure Professor Tao is still online or not. So thank you on behalf of this of the director of the research. Again, for your contribution to the seminar. Thank you so much. Professor Tao, are you still online? Do you want to say a few words before we close? I guess she's not online. Probably is engaging in something else. Okay. If that's the case, can we? Yeah, thank you so much. Can we just end our seminar here? Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, stay safe, continue good work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, we, we, we finish here now. Thank you so much. Bye-bye mm. now. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.